Well, this is going to be fun. Um, through my eBay selling, I, I offer some parts and I offer manuals through eBay. I ended up selling some motor brushes to a gentleman down in Florida, and he contacted me afterwards, and, and it was for a Husqvarna green machine. He contacted me after he received the brushes, and he said, these aren't going to fit. They're not going to work. I said, well, what's the problem? He goes, they're, they're too big. I said, I'll bet. I said, tell me what you have. He says, I have a Type 21. I said, I'll bet you you have a free Westinghouse motor in your machine, and it's not an original Husqvarna. And he goes, really? So he ended up, uh, we, we kind of broke away from that. He ended up taking the back of his uh, motor cover off calls me back and he goes, you're absolutely right. I said, it's interesting. I did a premiere on this a while back. The three different types of motors that Husqvarna used, the traditional one, a free Westinghouse one, and then they had a closed case motor as well. Do you all remember that premiere I did? Kind of highlighting those three different motors that Husqvarna has in their green machines. Well, John, and his last name is Smith, and I'm not making that up, John Smith ended up getting a machine that had that free Westinghouse motor, which takes a smaller brush than the regular Husqvarna Swedish motor. So we kind of developed a friendship through this uh, mishap of him having, having the wrong brushes, and I sent him the correct brushes, and then he started sharing some things about his life. He talked about his Navy time. He talked about working and retiring from NASA down in Florida, which is where he and his family live. And he, he shared that in working in the Navy, he was a, uh, a parachutist uh, and became a master parachutist rigger and uh, ended up putting together uh, parachutes using sewing machines aboard aircraft carriers. And he was on a variety of different aircraft carriers that he'll probably talk about during the interview. And then he went on after that, after he retired from the Navy, he went on to work for NASA and worked in their department where you know how when the space shuttles would land in that and also when the uh, solid boosters would separate you'd see it on the uh, the feed as they were showing the, the launch and everything and then the parachutes would deploy and those huge rocket bo boosters would float back down to earth he was involved in making those parachutes so he's had a very interesting life of having contact with sewing machines and sewing and I said, John, I've got to interview you. And he's initially like, oh, I'm just a regular Joe. There's nothing special about me. But then he mentioned it to his family and to his wife. And they were like, no, 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 no. You definitely have something special to share. That might be John right there. Hey, John. I can see your, I can see your chest. <laughs> now I can see you. I was just sharing with the folks, and we're actually shooting live right now. I shared with them how we met uh, through you making an eBay purchase and getting the wrong motor brushes. And I and I, I asked my subscribers and my followers. I said, "You remember that premiere I shot about a year ago, highlighting the different motors that the that are in the Husqvarna green machines?" I said, "Well, John and I met that way because he's got a free Westinghouse motor, and I sent him brushes for a traditional Swedish motor." And then he started sharing things about his background, working uh, in the Navy, working at NASA. And I said, I got to interview you. And I, I mentioned to them, I said, initially, you were real reluctant. You were like, oh, I'm just a regular Joe. And then your family and others kind of influenced you. said, no, you got a story to tell. You got a story to tell. But what I wanted to do first is honor you as a fellow veteran. So hold on a second. And yes, I'm standing up, out of respect. So that was a special thing I queued up just to acknowledge your naval service. And... Uh, I guess, well, I'm going to stop it right there, and I wanted to play that as a special treat for you, and also before I forget, hold on, I wanted to play that as a special treat for you, 
uh, because the unboxing today is actually relating to the gentleman that I had the privilege and honor of interviewing. And if you haven't watched that premiere yet, doggone it, you if you if you miss a lot of other premieres, you don't want to miss this one. And the title of it, the way you can find it, it's it's going to be from, let's see if it gives me the date. Special interview John Smith, that is his real name, used and worked on sewing machines in the Navy and at NASA. So that's a real long title. And it looks like I premiered it on... September 9th, so hadn't really planned that, but just two days before the anniversary of September 11th, and what a, what a, what a, what a fitting thing to honor uh, a gentleman like John Smith, who uh, faithfully uh, and, and with distinction served our country through the Navy uh, in a variety of different ways that he speaks to in this interview on my channel and also uh, served on the team at NASA as well to uh, bring success to the shuttle program when that was still a real, real big deal uh, back in the day. So we have the privilege. He ended up sending me the Swedish beauty that you'll see in that premiere on the screen right now. Uh, and I'm going to do a complete service on it. I'm going to do some motor work, a variety of other things to his machine. So I've let the cat out of the bag as to what machine this is and the other immediate cue as to what type of machine it might be is yes we have his majesty the king of sweden uh present during this premiere and that tells you right away that inside of this box that we're going to unbox is going to be uh none other than a swedish beauty uh, the king always likes to be present whenever he can be uh, for special occasions like this where we're welcoming a Swedish beauty into the workshop and then we're going to be doing all of the magic to make that Swedish beauty just run at the top of its game again. And I put a couple little things down at the king's uh, uh, foot right there, in a sense. I stole the real cool vintage iron. And if you haven't seen one of these, let me... Uh, Move His Majesty the King, and I'll show you this iron uh, real quick. I have no idea how old it is. Thank you, Your Majesty. Uh, I have no idea how old it is, but it is old. And Mr. Bean has been using it on his uh, sewing room, or in his sewing room, I should say, uh, as a means to... Uh, put together uh, various garments. He has a sewing machine usually on top of this. He originally had a table. He didn't like the table. So now he's gone to this. And obviously this doesn't go anywhere. It's very stable. So you can see the AG, what is that? AG Williams Company. If anyone, anyone wants to try to look that up and tell us a little bit about this piece, uh, I think that would be super cool. And if my camera stops moving, you'll be able to see it. <laughs> So the A.G. Williams Company, you can see it on the top. And then on the bottom, it's a little bit shadowed. Let me see if I can zoom in on that. Okay, it just gives where it was made. Uh, in Ohio somewhere, it looks like. I think that's Ohio. So if anyone wants to look this up for fun and give us some details on this particular very, very vintage iron, uh, that would be super cool. And I'm not real, real familiar with these, so if anyone wants to share something about it as well, uh, that would be, you know, super awesome. You know, obviously you would put it on something real hot, you know, presumably a stove or something, and you would heat up that base that's probably about almost three inches thick, and then you would iron things with it, and there was a special clip on top that you would attach to it uh, to do the ironing. That's the extent of what I know about it, and I don't think Mr. Bean has done any research on it either. And I'm really intrigued. I just noticed now in the shot, you've got those two bolts on either end. Maybe all that does is remove the top of it so you can... I have no idea. Again, an opportunity for somebody to research it. And you know what? If you post something really interesting and really cool about uh, this company... Again, the company is uh, A.G. Williams Company, uh, presumably out of Ohio. If you post something really cool, I'll send you something special. And then just because the king was here and he needs protection. I mean, it's the king, for goodness sakes. 
uh, he brought along his cannon as well, just in case someone wanted to mess with him. Of course, you know, Mr. Bean, Dr. Singer, they, they would have done, they, they would have dealt with it. They would have watched out for the king. So, so at any rate, I just thought this was cool to uh, have the king standing on that. And Mr. Bean is looking to get it back because I think he's right in the middle right now of a quilting project or something. So I'm going to give it back to him so he can set his machine back up on it again. And this sucker is heavy too. If you, uh, holy mackerel. Yeah, it does look like it takes the, takes the whole top of this thing off is kind of what it does. And there's a, a little plate on the inside of there too. And I doubt that any, anyone watching this is old enough to remember these, but maybe you are. If you are, that's even cooler. First hand knowledge and information as far as uh, how these were used and where they were used and all that kind of stuff would be super neat. All right. Well, let's begin the process of uh, opening up this box that John Smith sent with his Swedish beauty. And uh, during the course of this premiere, it shouldn't be a huge surprise to you, but I'm going to be playing a lot of military-style music. And as much as I can find, I'll, I'll play some naval music as well. So, let's see here. So that first one I just played is called the Naval, Naval Academy March. The Naval Academy March. I'm going to scroll down a ways, see what else I can find. Oh yeah, you've heard this one before. Uh, we'll do one more uh, song that is uh, specific to the Navy, Anchors Away. And this is the choral, this is the choral ver uh, version that I played before uh, for you folks. I love this one. I think it's fabulous. Yeah, I love that piece a lot. Well, I'm hoping uh, hoping John's machine fared okay. Um, it doesn't look like it. It's got it's got padding around the machine itself, and it's got paper underneath. I can feel underneath the machine, but uh, there's obviously quite a bit of room for the machine to be moving around. We have all this open space up here uh, where the machine is. It's uh, laid like this. It basically bounces kind of up and down, up and down, up and down. And obviously you can tell by this that it's uh, facing down, which means those plastic knobs are facing down towards the bottom of the box. Uh, so I'm a little bit nervous, but uh, this isn't John's first rodeo, I'm sure, in uh, packing something to, uh, to be shipped. So uh, I'll just trust that even though it's not the way I would recommend that it be packaged, and you can see as well, we got kind of a buckling of the box here uh, where this machine probably was moving back and forth as well and kind of pressing against the sides of the, the box. Not a super thick corrugated box, but it, uh, it made it here. And once we get it out, we'll be able to inspect it. 
and uh, see if we have any uh, damage that's evident. But just a, a tip for all of the rest of you that are looking at shipping your uh, vintage machines, especially the, uh, the Husqvarna's, um, if you have a case for it, always use the case. And I don't know if John has a case or not, but if you have a case, put it in the case, pad it inside of the case to immobilize it so that it can't jo be jostled around inside of the case. And then you'll go through the same stretch wrapping and bubble wrapping and all the process that you've seen in my packing videos to uh, secure the hinges, to uh, pad the outside of that, that uh, carrying case, and just to make sure that you've got about a two and a half to three inch uh, padding of bubble wrap and stretch wrap all the way around that entire case uh, to keep it safe. Um, I talk about the vintage fairies all the time looking out for vintage sewing machines when they're in transit coming to the workshop or going back to the customer's home. So let's just keep our fingers crossed that the vintage fairies were on duty and they were looking out for John's uh, Swedish beauty uh, coming from Florida up to Wisconsin. Uh, we'll just keep our fingers crossed. But again, if this were your packing uh, for your Swedish beauty, this looks fine. This looks pretty good. Uh, just fill all of this with uh, peanuts or with some other padding so that you're immobilizing that machine so it can't be jostled around uh, from side to side or up and down. Because with all of this open space, there's a huge, huge opportunity uh, for that to happen. Okay, all right. So I'm gonna go back on the tripod and we will continue the unboxing of John Smith's uh, Type 21, I believe it is, uh, Swedish Beauty, and we'll see how how it did on the journey. So that was obviously anchors away, and that was the coral version, and you notice that the uh, United States Marine Corps, being as clever and as smart as they are, just like the Navy, obviously, uh, they, they snuck into that piece, even though it's labored, labeled, uh, even though it's labeled anchors away, they still got the Semper Fi part of their music into that as well. So I thought that was kind of cool the first time I heard it. All right, so this is the musical version, the musical score with no singing uh, of the same tune, Anchors Away, from 1921. So I'm guessing it's going to sound like we're listening to an old-fashioned radio program playing this particular piece. Here we go. I'll just show you real quick. This feels like it is a Bakelite foot controller with this, which isn't good. I'll explain why in just a bit. But uh, the thread guide, let me turn my screen around here. <clears throat> I don't know if you can see inside of the box right here. But this, uh, this cut through on the box, and it almost went all the way through, uh, is from the thread guide uh, right adjacent to the faceplate, uh, which wasn't padded well enough, so it actually cut through the box. Uh, I felt it with my fingers. It feels like it's not broken, thank goodness. But uh, again, you want to pad that machine well enough that if you press against it, you're not able to feel any of the contours of that machine, anything poking through. So uh, just be mindful of that, because something like this could have been uh, catastrophic uh, in uh, resulting in that uh, thread guide on top getting broken off. And that thread guide is really, really hard to replace, because uh, so many people break them. 
So uh, finding a replacement sometimes can be a real, uh, a real challenge. And I've seen a number of people that try to craft their own, but it never quite works out as well as the original. So, uh, you know, just, just make sure. And then also on the bottom here, in the bottom of John's box, uh, he had a bubble wrap like this wrap or too close. Uh, he had bubble wrap like this. You can see in the shot wrapped around uh, the machine but you also want to put additional padding in the bottom of the box just because that's going to be the part that gets dropped and banged around quite a bit uh, when it's being shipped. Okay, so we'll get that machine on the workbench and take a closer look, see how it, how it fared as far as its journey from uh, Florida up here to Wisconsin. And I'm guessing that's probably, what, about 1,100 miles, something like that. So that obviously was anchors away, and you notice the Marine Corps wasn't able to slide into that one. Navy was watching. They were on, they were on guard duty saying, the Marines are not going to participate in this one. <laughs> so, oh, gosh, I've got a bunch of anchors away versions. Here's another one. I'll just play the beginning. I would see if we've heard it before. I think we've heard one similar to this, but not exactly this. We'll go ahead and play it. Poor guy in this one. Kind of see what John meant now. Uh, his machine has uh, quite a rough look to it for a Swedish beauty. Quite a rough look, but uh, in her own way, she is beautiful too. And I agree with John in that respect. I think all Swedish beauties, even if they show signs of uh, having had a rough life, they're a Swedish beauty for goodness' sake. You can't take that away. So she has a. Uh, a look of having gotten a lot of use and uh, maybe a little bit of abuse but uh, we will see what we can do with uh, John's very very special type 21 once I get the cord untangled here and I will try actually you know what I, I'm not even going to try testing this one and I'll tell you why I'll test the light maybe but I'm not going to try testing uh, the motor because that was part of the issue that John presented uh, with this machine. So I think the, the motor, I don't think the motor is going to do a doggone thing. Oh, I apologize. Let me broaden this shot a little bit. But you can, you can see yeah, as we're looking at the machine, it's, uh, it's got some bumps and bruises. Or sewing scars, as I call them, too. Badges of honor. Okay, let me see if I can pick something other than Anchors Away, because all of you are going to be humming that and not be able to get it out of your head. So we'll put on some other military-type music. And this is called uh, Old Lang Syne. Here we go. Yeah, we'll save that for New Year's. How about Battle Hymn of the Republic? <clears throat> oh, 
Oh no, this is not a Bakelite. What is going on with this though? It's it's crushed down. I wonder if this got this got damaged uh, in transit. Okay, so this foot control is rated for one amp, one amp. <clears throat> and that's a 1.5 amp motor on uh, this type, type 21. So the foot controller is, is under the amperage that it should be to handle this machine. So I'll have to share that with John and we'll look at a solution. But again, you always want to have your foot controller have a higher amperage tolerance than the machine itself. <clears throat> and with this uh, Type 21 having a 1.5 amp uh, motor, a Westinghouse motor is what's inside of it. Uh, this should be rated at at least 1.5 or above and it's only rated at one amp. Plus it has something going on with it. Maybe it was crushed or banged up or something weird because that's where the foot controller is right now and it should be fully in the up position. And that's all we're getting from it. So this, this may be repairable, it may not be repairable. Uh, but I'll send it back with the machine, but we'll still have to find a replacement, uh, a substitution for John's machine so that it's uh, covering that full 1.5 amps not right now it's basically a five tenths of a of an amp underneath the amperage with only one amp versus 1.5 all right let me come off the tripod we'll get a little bit closer to john's machine and uh, take a look at it And I'll also plug this in and see if we can get the light working at least. I don't think we'll get the motor working. The motor's got an issue. So the light is working fine. We'll, we'll probably replace this for John with uh, one of the uh, high uh, output LED ones. Matter of fact, I'm going to pull that out real quick. This is one of the elongated incandescent type bulbs. See how long it is? Super duper long. But it's still only rated at, uh, what is it? It's a Japanese bulb, 120 volts, but it doesn't give us uh, the watt output. So, but I would guess probably right around 25 watts, somewhere in that realm. sang this in choir when I was in high school and college and I always had the part in the background listen to the main part we would do truth is marching in the back of the ground truth is marching truth is marching truth is marching truth is marching you can hear it yeah <laughs> what a great, what a great song. Oh my gosh. Well, that's a lot brighter. <laughs> Obviously, 
uh, even though that's a, that's a perfectly fine Japanese incandescent bulb, again, I'm guessing around 25 watts. It could be less. Uh, as soon as you put that LED light in, uh, you're getting probably about four times the, uh, the lighting power of what that incandescent bulb can put out. Just, just absolutely fabulous. LED bulbs are one of the greatest uh, innovations that we've come up with from a standpoint of lighting. Less heat, more brightness. They have different versions of LEDs that will give you either a bright or a soft, uh, different, I guess different temperatures in a sense. Warmer lights versus, you know, you know what I'm saying. But uh, a huge difference in being able to see what's happening on the bed and down at the needle. So I'll just throw that in and that'll be a special gift to my friend uh, John Smith uh, for all the great things that he's done uh, in his life. Special way to honor him. So let me put on another tune. We'll walk around the machine a little bit. I'll probably come off the tripod so we can look at it really, really close. Uh, and uh, we will wrap this uh, premiere up pretty quick. Well, this is under <coughs> this is under military two, uh, and we've heard it before. The emperor's the emperor's maneuver. Let's hear what that sounds like. <laughs> All right, let's go around John's machine and take a closer look at it. And if you're not familiar with the Swedish Beauties, this is to drop the feed dogs right here. When it's uh, the dot is at the 12 o'clock position, they're fully engaged, and you can turn it clockwise down to there, right around uh, the 6 o'clock position, and uh, the feed dogs will be fully down. And then just rotate it back up when you want them fully engaged. Stitch width control, anywhere from uh, 0 if you're doing a straight stitch, all the way up to 4. Stitch length, uh, anywhere from four at the very bottom is going to give you the longest stitch up to uh, almost at zero where uh, you're going to be uh, barely moving the material. Uh, you'll probably, I mean, if you're just a little bit below it, you'll be real close to 30 stitches per inch. And then if you go all the way up, you're sewing in reverse. This does a couple of things. It gives you access to the cams by sliding this little slider in and out. If we go to the other side, you'll see the numbers. From one to five. So again, if you move this, uh, slide it in or out, you'll be able to select whatever stitch is gonna be on that cam. And I didn't see what letter cam is in the back of uh, John's machine right now. But on all of these cams that are in these uh, green machine Husqvarna's, they're black cam, in position five, you're always going to have a zigzag. And then position four, three, two, one on each cam will be unique to that cam as far as what uh, stitch pattern it's going to have. And as I recently discovered through my friend uh, uh, Hans Christian from uh, Norway, uh, I was always under the impression that pretty much the, the cams that went with these green machines was A, B, C, D. D was nearly impossible to find, and Hans has confirmed that as well. He said, I've been looking for a D forever. I cannot find one. Well, I will share with him or share with you, and if he happens to be watching this, he'll discover it, that I just acquired another D cam, so I'm going to be sending him a D cam, and he said that he would probably share with me an E cam, uh, the, the only ecam that he has that I can simply use in a premiere and then I would return it to him. I would not want to keep it because I would want him to have that for the variety of Swedish beauties he, that he has, uh, the green machines that will take that particular cam. But I'm going to give him a decam to keep so that he'll have a complete set 
for any of his Green Machine Swedish Beauties uh, in Norway. He'll have A, B, C, D, and E, which that's Bregan rights, folks. That's Bregan rights, right? So, <laughs> so, so again, you just slide this in and out to select the different uh, stitch patterns that are on the cam that's in the rear. Position five again is always going to be uh, a zigzag, and as I've explained in other premieres, I believe you never want to operate one of these green machines without a cam in the rear of it. And that is because the cam not only gives you stitch patterns, it also sets the swing boundaries of any of these stitches that are going to generate uh, needle movement. So anything at all, you know, whether it's a stretch pattern, a decorative pattern, a zigzag pattern, that cam is also going to set the left and right boundaries of how far that needle swings. Without the cam in the back, you may be able to roll the dice for quite a while and do okay, but in all likelihood, inevitably, that needle eventually is going to strike this plate uh, as it's trying to pass through uh, the opening of that throat plate. So I would say to be, to be safe rather than sorry, make sure you always have a cam in the back of there so that that needle doesn't exceed the boundaries of uh, that throat plate and uh, potentially strike it. Okay, that is a, a, a real important thing for you to note if you either own or if you're going to own uh, one of these uh, Green Machine Swedish Beauties. Okay, <clears throat> trying to get my finger in there. Oh, okay, I'm opening it backwards. Duh. So, and again, if you're really, really new to Swedish Beauties, I'll point this out on John's machine. And I don't know that John knew this either. He might have, I don't recall, but uh, this raceway was designed in a special way. If we move, uh, remove this uh, bobbin case, you'll notice that this uh, area right in here by the hook and shuttle area uh, has movement to it right now. See how that moves from left to right and up and down? That's not broken. That is uh, specially designed uh, in these Swedish beauties so that when this machine is operating, this area in here that that thread will be moving through has the ability to move up and down and left and right, which reduces the likelihood of getting a jam. Uh, the Swedish basically proudly called it their jam-free raceway. You can run heavier thread through here and everything, and generally you never experience any problems. Now, you got to keep this area very clean, and obviously part of the reason that John sent it to me is so I can do a deep cleaning on this Swedish Beauty as well. And uh, this area right here, I call it the brain center of uh, the machine. Uh, and it's true of any machine for that matter. Uh, you want to keep this spick and span with just a real light coat of machine oil, even though according to the manuals that the Swedish put out for their Husqvarna uh, Type 21s like this and the other green machines, they said it did not require any lubrication down here. Uh, I, di I disagree. Uh, you always want to put with a Q-tip swab, a light swab of oil uh, on the inside of this area right here where that bobbin case is going to go into. Ideally, you'll want to remove these uh, three uh, bolts, these three bolts right here, and take this assembly completely out and clean it uh, completely. And then also the back side of this hook you'll also want to put a light coat of machine oil on that as well okay and when I take this through my 126 step process and if you're new to this channel if you don't know it when I get a Swedish beauty into the workshop I have a 126 step process that I take a Swedish beauty like John's through and John's is going to go through the same thing and that machine until it goes through that process I call it my Swedish beauty finalization process 126 steps that I go through in going through the machine from bobbin to balance wheel. And once it passes all of those steps, then I premiere the machine, and then ultimately that machine is shipped back to the customer. But how many steps do you think the average sewing center or service center is going to take a machine like this? If John took this into one of those service centers, how many steps do you think they would go through on it? less than 20. 
That's if they're doing a real good job by their standards. They would take it through between 15 to 20 steps, uh, which also would not include disassembling the upper tension and all the other steps that I take a Swedish Beauty through. So that's another reason that people will make that extra investment into sending the machine in, just as John Smith did. A uh, very wise man, very smart move, so that he knows that that machine is going to be gone through with a surgical scalpel through those 126 steps. So every part of that machine is going to be touched. Every part of that machine is going to be serviced, uh, adjusted, and renewed. So when he gets it back, it's going to be running at a level that he probably has never, ever experienced before with a Swedish beauty. And that's that's a God truth. That's a God you know what I'm saying. That's that's the absolute truth. Um, <clears throat> and also, if you're um, new to Swedish beauties, <clears throat> pardon me, all of them are going to have a slightly different design in adjusting presser foot pressure. John's is different than some of the other Type 21s and some of the other green machines. With his, he has a simple... Uh, knob right here that you're going to rotate to the rear or forward depending on how much pressure foot pressure you want again the simple rule is you want to have heavier pressure foot pressure when you go through heavier materials uh, thicker materials so that that pressure foot is pushing down harder against that material so that it's working in concert with the feed dogs to move that material through more evenly so thicker, heavier material, more presser foot pressure. Lighter materials, less presser foot pressure. And if this uh, one is the same as all the other ones are, which it is, if you want to increase presser foot pressure, give me a second here, you're going to rotate this to the rear. If you want to decrease presser foot pressure, you're going to rotate it to the front, which will reduce the amount of pressure that pressure that's pushed down on that presser foot. Again, I said it, it's a little bit of a tongue twister. Presser foot pressure. Yeah, it is. So, uh, and this, there are multiple areas even within the faceplate that need to be serviced need to be serviced as well. So just be mindful of that if you're not wanting to uh, make the same wise move of sending in your Swedish Beauty. Uh, to the workshop and this little take-up spring right here. I've explained this in other premieres As the machine is sewing you'll notice that depending on the rate of speed that you're operating the machine at this is going to be going up and down Very rapidly and the reason it goes up and down like that is for a microsecond between the uh, the stroke of that needle bar going all the way down all the way up it's releasing tension just temporarily so that that uh, thread can advance and you can complete the sewing process. If one of these is bent, if it's real, real dirty, it's not going to function as well and you might get thread breaking, you might get uneven stitches and a variety of other symptoms telling you that that upper tension needs to be uh, taken apart, cleaned, lubricated in the parts that it needs to be lubricated, stripped of varnishing and oil and, and dirt in the parts that should not have that on there. Well, really none of it should, but I, I mean the oil aspect. And then uh, reassembling it. And this is one of those tensioners on this particular Type 21 where you might have to pass this number three a couple of times in order to get the proper upper tension. In other words, it's not going to be you you know you start at a certain point and you just turn it to that point and then you stop uh, and think that three is the max you might have to go all the way around a couple of times and s eventually stop on three in order to get the proper tension particularly if this bobbin case which I've taken out <laughs> particularly if this bobbin case is set too high and again this bigger screw that you can see that my finger is pointing at is going to be the screw that you adjust to increase or decrease bobbin pull. And again, for the, you folks that are real new to sewing, because the principle is going to be the same, not just with Swedish Beauties, but with all machines. The, the small little screw on the left 
is going to be the uh, the basically the tension band screw that should be tightened all the way down to hold the band in place that you can kind of see here. It's a tension band that this that the thread goes underneath, and depending on how far you turn the bigger screw clockwise will determine how much tension is being pressed down through this metal band against that thread that's being fed through this bobbin case. So if someone in the past, let's say you just bought this machine or you inherited it or you acquired it in some way, if someone turned this larger screw all the way clockwise way, 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 way down, so there's a huge amount of tension on this uh, metal band, then if you don't make adjustments to this bobbin case, you're going to have to crank this way up to countermand the tension on here because this bobbin case is going to be pulling down to define that top stitch. This upper tension is going to be pulling up to try to define that lock stitch. And if this is, just think of it as like a, like a muscle man in a weightlifting place, if this, this bobbin case is cranked way down with that larger, larger screw and it's pulling down with a lot of force like a muscle man, then this upper tension is going to have to try to countermand that by pulling up, by increasing this, increasing this, increasing this. Well, that's kind of ridiculous, don't you think? What you should do in the case like that is use a very small screwdriver and back this upper uh, uh, this uh, top stitch, blah, 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 back this uh, bobbin pole down to a point that's reasonable. And what's reasonable generally, when you grab this thread, which I can't do right now because I'm holding the camera at the same time, but when you pull this thread and you have this bobbin case out, you should have about two to three ounces of resistance as far as how hard that screw is causing that band to push down on the thread coming out of this exit point on the bobbin case. Does that make sense? So again, when you if you take this bobbin case out initially and you go to pull this thread, and again, don't be pushing on this, uh, this bobbin on the back or you're gonna get a skewed version of how much tension is actually being uh, exhibited against that uh, metal band. Uh, if, but if you pull and you're not pushing against this bobbin and you're just holding the bobbin in a way that it can freely distribute that thread out and there's a lot of resistance. In other words, when you pull on that thread, it's like, holy mackerel, that's kind of hard to pull. That screw is way too far down. You want to back it counterclockwise to a point where when you pull it, you can feel resistance, but it's, it's a light resistance. And then you'll be pretty close in the range of two to three ounces of drag that that metal band is putting on that thread to again define that top stitch. This defines the top stitch, this defines the lock stitch. So if you've never heard that explanation before, then this is very relevant that I'm taking the time to do this uh, with John's machine. And again, it's a tug of war. Depending on where you have this set, it's gonna be pulling up. Depending on where you have this set, it's gonna be pulling uh, down. So you got to get that sweet spot, that balance, where these are working in concert together to get that knot from the lock stitch centered right in the middle of that material and getting a nicely defined top stitch, getting a nicely defined lock stitch without having to crank this up, without this being cranked well up as well. Without this being cranked well up as well. Yeah, that didn't make any sense, but you know what I meant. So uh, that is the quick, brief tutorial on balancing stitch um, tension between the upper tension and the bobbin case. Uh, and this doesn't just apply again to the Swedish Beauty. It applies to any machine that has ever been made. It's going to be the same principle. Okay? Okay, I, and give me a quick, you know, thumbs up or give me a quick smiley face in the chat if you found that explanation helpful. Uh, otherwise, I can always circle back in another premiere and explain it again. Depending on how much coffee I've gotten during uh, the events leading up to a premiere will sometimes determine how much clarity I have in my explanation. So, uh, But I had shown you in the unboxing uh, the punch through on the box that went almost all the way through all the layers of that corrugated cardboard. And it was a result of this tension guide right here this uh this thread guide excuse me this thread guide on the front it's almost like a blade style 
and it actually because it didn't have enough padding over it it actually cut right into the corrugated uh, cardboard thank goodness it didn't break off uh, nor did this one so this is an area on your Swedish Beauty if you ship it to the workshop add even extra layers of padding to this so that it doesn't have the occasion to punch through uh, if that machine is jostled around a lot uh, in transit and you can see as you've seen in other premieres a lot of the uh, face plates on these Swedish beauties will have stamped right here made in Sweden uh, this type 21 does not have that distinction for whatever reason uh, they just elected not to stamp uh, this particular faceplate so uh, it's also not closing real evenly I'll have to look at those hinges see how it hinges right here this uh, it's basically a metal band that goes from top to bottom that it kind of floats on as you open and close it and right now you're having to lift it a little bit to get it to close properly but before I close it, let me answer another question that I've gotten from people all around the world, even from Sweden, where this machine was made. Where do you find the serial number on Swedish Beauties? Well, I'm focused on it right now. Right on the inside where that take-up arm would be going up and down, up and down, up and down. Right there you can see it. And Hans is a great resource. He's done a really good job of beginning to create a database based on the serial numbers on the Swedish Beauty to give you an approximate production date for that machine because I'll just be honest the Swedish did not do a stellar job in maintaining records of when they produced their machines nothing like Singer at all Singer did a phenomenal job for most of their machines in creating a database that you can track as I recently shared also through a post uh, even through their letter sequences that are part of the serial numbers, they did a really good job in helping people to date their machines. The Swedish didn't do as great of a job, but with Hans' assistance, uh, we should be able to get a fairly good idea of when this machine was produced. And if you have questions as well, you can always post them through the Facebook uh, Cow Country uh, page. Hans and Bill see all of those messages that come in. Uh, and uh, Hans usually will grab those ones where someone's asking about the dating of Swedish beauties because he's done a phenomenal job of building a database uh, where we can get a better understanding of when these Swedish beauties were made. Otherwise, quite honestly, we would, we would be spitting in the dark or shooting in the dark or whatever the phrase might be. Uh, spitting to the wind, I think, is what it is, actually. So uh, that's where you find your serial number on green machines, right inside of the faceplate. What else? You can see this one even as it was coming into the American marketplace, they slapped it with what was a big deal back in the 50s and 60s and that uh, good housekeeping seal, which right away was a sales point for people in the American marketplace uh, because that right away told people that item that receives this distinction, uh, it's quality, it's well made, it's going to last. Uh, because back then they were pretty persnickety about who they gave these stickers to. I'm not sure how they were eventually put on the machines, whether they arrived in the U.S. and then, you know, a dealer, a Husqvarna dealer, slapped one of these on so that it had more credibility in the American marketplace. I have no idea. But at some point these were put on. I've seen them on a lot of the Swedish beauties and on other uh, makes and models as well because people knew back in the 50s and 60s in particular, it was a big deal to have that sticker on the product, whether it was a sewing machine or whatever it was. So, uh, and there's just a lot of, on John's machine, and this is not being critical of him in any way, he's a great man, and I have a great deal of respect for him, but uh, this is just one of the areas, again, it just shows you uh, the deferred maintenance those are you know basically dust and cobwebs and stuff like that in there and again through my 126 step process it's done it's not going to be like that when it gets done but a lot of these surface blemishes in that there's there's not a lot that I'm going to do to it I'm going to do general cleanup and also this area as well you can see this uh, kind of draws the air in into the motor as it's running the little areas like that are all part of that step process that are you know, it's really critical to do that. Again, dirt is not the friend of our vintage sewing machines. But, um, 
you can kind of see what John was saying. It's it's not a super uh, pristine machine, but it's still pretty. It's still very, very pretty. Just kind of walking around the machine a little bit so we can check all sides of it. And, and this... This wear mark I see a lot on the Swedish Beauties, and it's because that balance wheel is so tight to the machine that as folks are operating that balance wheel and turning it, your thumb or your finger, something like that, has constant contact with the machine as you're turning the balance wheel, and it inevitably rubs the clear coat off, takes the finish off, takes the paint off, and eventually it goes all the way down to the metal like this. So... Uh, it is what it is. I mean, it, that's a, again a sign that this machine has gotten a lot of use. Uh, it's had a, a very, very busy life, which is a good thing. And some of this I'll be able to address. This varnishing and this oil will get some of that cleaned up and just give uh, the machine a little bit better finish on it. And this is a non-traditional uh, way of holding this balance wheel on, there's actually, a, a, normally there's going to be a small little bolt that's going to recess into the hand wheel so it's not protruding out like this. Uh, so that when you take uh, the balance wheel on and off, it's just a matter of removing that screw. But this is something that maybe John came up with this because the other one was was missing. Um, although it certainly looks like, although I've, I haven't seen a lot of these, it certainly looks like it belongs, doesn't it? Yeah, it does. And obviously over here we've got our bobbin winding area of the machine. Uh, this is something that you can pull out. And I think John attempted to do this when we were uh, chatting. And it wasn't working correctly. And it's not working correctly right now. It's, it's basically jammed. But this should freely come out. And that will allow you to engage that slow gear. And again, the slow gear is going to take that motor from full power uh, all the way down to one-fifth. And then also when you want to wind a bobbin, all you do is slide, slide the bobbin on here. And there's a little tab underneath here that you can't quite see. That sliding the bobbin on is going to depress that tab. And then it's going to automatically, by, by that simple act of sliding the bobbin on, it's going to disengage that clutch so that there's no uh, needle movement uh, down uh, by the um, feed dogs. Let's see what else we have. So again, you can just see gen general cleanliness uh, issues, varnishing, just signs that the machine has had a, a little bit of a rough life. And here's our data plate where you can see um, the machine is uh, rated for uh, U.S. Uh, uh, electrical circuitry to use a fancy way of saying it it's wired for the u.s uh 110 120 volts and you can see over here this was my concern where it has the amps if we get real close you can see it's a one comma five and one comma five one comma five tells you that this is a 1.5 amp uh westinghouse motor in john's machine and again this foot controller which seems like it's pretty defunct Again, it's not even fully extended up. In spite of that, it's still not the appropriate foot controller because this is rated at 1 amp. This machine is going to peak at 1.5 amps or higher, you know, depending on how the, the flow of electricity comes into the machine. So the two are incompatible. Uh, the result is that even if this were fully functional, which it's not, uh, it would have a tendency, especially when you're doing slow sewing, uh, to overheat because the motor is demanding more energy which has to flow through here than the foot controller is able to handle and so that's what happens when the motor is higher than the foot controller you're going to get a foot controller that overheats now if the foot controller is rated higher in amperage than the motor no worries uh, that'll give a wide enough uh, berth and tolerance between the two 
that that motor will be able to run at the highest level possible without compromising uh, the safety of the foot controller. And it's not just a matter of the foot controller getting hot. In extreme cases, it could get to a point where it actually could catch fire. I mean, it's that serious. When you're talking about 0.5 amp difference, 1.5 versus 1 amp, that's that's a that's a real that's a, that's a big margin. It's a big margin. That would be like the difference between uh, the rating of a FOF machine plus a featherweight versus just the FOF on its own. FOF is usually going to be right around 1 amp, 1.1. Featherweight's going to be 0.4 amps. So you're looking at that big of a difference. You're basically this is this is only able to handle uh, a one amp machine. This motor is putting out the equivalent of a one amp machine plus more more amperage than even what a featherweight puts out. So that's when you think of it in those terms, you're basically looking at a machine and a half versus one machine that this foot controller can handle. It's significant. So we'll deal with that as well. These have a tendency to get broken off a lot in shipment, so I'm glad that this arrives safely with this intact, along with all the plastic uh, knobs on the other side. And you can see that this was designed to take uh, <clears throat> a prong-style plug-in like you'll see in uh, European markets for general outlets. And this is what John is working with right now. He's done the best that he can to try to make it safe He's got the correct uh, prongs to plug into the back of the machine, but uh, he's used a combination of electrical tape and some sort of a rubber boot to go over these as well. And inevitably, I mean, it's, it's just a pain in the neck because there's no plastic housing to hold it straight. So they may have a tendency to, if the machine is moving a little bit or vibrating, it may have a tendency to kind of get dislodged from the plug-in point. It'll work, but it's not ideal. So we'll see if we can address this as well when we're looking at a replacement that's appropriate for this machine other than this one. So that was a really a long-winded explanation to say we're going to replace the foot controller. Now, if we're looking in the back, you can see over here uh, we've got uh, a replacement belt. It feels like it's a cogged belt. Matter of fact, I may have provided this to John. I don't remember. Uh, and then we've got a cleated belt as well. And then we've got the cam that's in here, which looks like it's going to be... What cam is that? You probably can see it better than I can see it through my little screen. Cam B. So we've got cam B in here right now. And I just saw a flicker on that light, which was kind of weird. I don't know if you saw that. Just checking to see if we've got a wiring deal going on in here. Yeah, I don't know what that was. The light kind of dimmed, and then it came back up again right away. So, who knows? I haven't gotten into this machine yet. So, so I'll just give you another quick little tip as well. Um, the little slider on the other side that's in conjunction with the stitch width, this thing right here, you can see that in the shot, this area, this little slider that goes in and out. If you're going to remove a cam, you always want to slide this all the way to the body of the machine so you're in position 5. And then the cam will be sticking far enough out that you can drop this little lever right here which has a spring on it. You drop it all the way down and then you can remove that cam, which I'm doing with one hand. <laughs> you can remove that cam more easily uh, so that you can... Uh, put another cam in or whatever you're going to do. Again, do not operate the machine like this with no cam in there because, again, this cam is going to set the boundaries, the swing boundaries of that, of that needle. But I think these are just fascinating in and of, in and of themselves. Uh, like the Singer video that I uh, shared with you on the landing page of my YouTube channel, uh, I would love to have been able to get into one of the Husqvarna factories and see how they made these. And uh, as I've mentioned in other premieres, these cams are absolute gold. These are absolutely gold, not, not just uh, the D's and the E's. I mean, the E is like unbelievably, ridiculously hard to get, as is the D. But even if you have an A, B, and C, those are gold. 
because you just can't find. You can check eBay, you can check Etsy, you can check Facebook Marketplace, you can check anywhere you want to check. Bonanza, uh, if you ever find a lot of these for sale, like LOT, a lot, where they're selling a bunch of them together, and you're not interested, call me, text me, call Hans, text him, send him a note through Messenger or whatever, and either he or I will jump all over it. Because these cams are absolute gold. You guys remember my friend, uh, FBI Mike? He and his wife that live out on the East Coast. He's retired FBI and she's uh, uh, one of the uh, highest ranking people in the FBI right now. That's what uh, got Mike and I acquainted with each other. Is he was looking for these cams. And I parted with two of my cams and sent them, sent, sent them to him out on the East Coast. Because he had searched everywhere else. And you couldn't find them anywhere. They're just that that hard to find. So uh, I will safeguard this for you, John. I promise. I'll keep it safe. Put it right over there for right now. And in here as well, there's just a ton of service points. Remember I talked about the average service center, that if you take in a machine like John's to their service center and you say, I want a full service on it, and they write you out a bill for $125 in all likelihood, or $150, as one person recently shared with me on, on Facebook Marketplace, uh, they're, they're, they're not going to do pretty much any servicing in here. They might put a couple drops of oil in there. But just in this area right here, there's almost 25 service points just in that region right there. To give you an idea of how, how critical this area is, but the fact that most service centers are going to do little or nothing to that area. So, and this whole panel uh, comes off, obviously. You've got, uh, you got a bolt here and a bolt there, and the whole panel comes off. And then there's more areas that you can reach for servicing purposes as well. So that's another part that I obviously will take off when I service this uh, machine for John. So again, I don't believe that this machine is set up right now where it's going to operate. I don't want to get shocked off of that either. I just rolled the dice and kind of plugged those puppies in. But I do have it plugged in right now with power, so I'm just going to try pushing this very defunct foot controller. But I'm going to do, I'm going to do it with a little bit of a buffer just so I don't potentially get shocked off of it. I'm going to use my uh, little mallet to kind of create a barrier between myself and the foot controller, see if anything happens. Hopefully nothing dramatic. Nothing. Nothing. And I think it's because there's an issue with that motor right now. Part of it is the motor brushes. Um, so we'll address that. But, uh, but the good news is that when this Swedish Beauty gets to the premier point, you're hardly going to recognize this machine. Hopefully you made a note of what the serial number is on the inside of the body of the machine, inside of that faceplate where I showed you. That way you know decisively, oh my gosh, that's the same machine. How the heck is it doing what it's doing? How is it looking the way it's looking? Because it's going to look a lot different too by the time I'm done, I'm done with John's uh, machine, no doubt. So this is John Smith's Type 21 that he sent from Florida. And uh, let's see if I can put on another tune to kind of wrap this up. Oh, why don't we do the Star Spangled Banner? That's about as patriotic as we can get, I think. And I am a very patriotic person, so let me put that on next. Wow, that's a weird sounding drum, isn't it? <laughs> 